Hey everyone, Adam here. Hope everyone's doing well. So, about to finish part two of this off-grid build today. Uh, I just finished building the form for the foundation last week, and any minute now, my concrete guy should be showing up to pour the slab. So I'm just gonna flip the camera around and show you what I got going on here. Okay, so here is the finished form. This is for a monolithic slab on grade foundation, which is just fancy talk for a big solid chunk of concrete. That's all gonna get poured at once. I built the form out of two by 12 boards cleated together with two by fours. And I did it in kind of an unconventional way, pretty much the story of my life, but I'll explain uh, what I did and why I did it this way. So normally what you would do is for this type of foundation, typically you would dig a pretty deep trench all the way around the perimeter, usually at least a foot deep and a foot wide, though that can change depending on your climate and other factors. If you're in a really cold climate, you're going to have to go below your frost line. That could be a lot deeper than a foot. Uh, if you're on soft ground, you're going to want to go into the ground, or if you're just building a really heavy building, you'll want to go deep into the ground. For me, I'm in a mostly dry, mostly warm climate on really hard ground. So it wasn't necessary for me to make such a deep footing all the way around the whole form. So what I did instead was I did it pretty much right on grade and then I made footing holes in the corners here. So every corner has one of these large holes. And you could think of those as like soccer cleats. That's going to help the building grab into the ground so it doesn't shift around over time. After I constructed the form, which by the way I actually had to do it twice because the first time this end was about three inches higher than that end and I figured well that's no good. So now I think I'm within acceptable tolerance which would be off by a quarter, quarter inch across 10 feet in any direction. It, you, most likely you're never going to get it 100% perfect, but you want to try to get as close as possible. I also think there's just ever so slightly a downward slope from this corner to that far corner. And that's a good thing for me because I'm building a low slope roof and that corner is where the water is going to get drained. So that should help get the water going in the direction I want it to go. But that's a subject for another video and a lot of other steps and stuff. So anyway, yeah, after I put the boards together, I threw a bunch of large rocks in the center of the form, about like uh, softball sized rocks. Then I filled it with structural dirt, which is really coarse dirt that's got a lot of gravel in it. It's pretty similar to the ground I'm walking on. And along the sides here, you can see I sort of made a grade to it. It doesn't come all the way right up to the edge of the boards. And that's because the heaviest part of the building is the exterior walls. So that's where you, it really counts to have the slab as thick as possible. In the center where your floors are going to go, that's not as important. So over here along the edges, at the bottom, well, I'm 11 inches deep, a little deeper in some areas. At the bottom, about eight inches wide, and then at the top, about 15 inches wide. And then the rest of the slab will be a four inch slab, which is gonna be plenty strong for the building I'm constructing. So yeah, I put about, so after I put the rocks in there, I put about, I think it was 13 tons in total of the structural dirt, and then another two inches of one inch crushed rock packed down on top of that. Uh, compacted it all down with a tamper. I just did it by hand. It really wasn't that bad. It's this 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 kind of dirt is actually pretty easy to compact and it got rained on several times uh, Since I started the construction so that just even further compacted it and made it harden up After that I did the rebar grid it's 3 8 inch rebar spaced about two feet apart. I just eyeballed it. I used 3 8 because it's really easy to handle and it's easy to bend. You can see here in the corners where I had to bend it to a 90 degree turn. And uh, I just did that with my hands like a gorilla. 
because I have super strength. It's actually not that hard to bend. And yeah. Oh, and there was another important thing I wanted to talk about. So, I've probably got more rocks and gravel in here than dirt, or at least 50-50. And there are a lot of benefits to that. So the, the rocks and the gravel, they provide good drainage. They provide a really solid base. They create a lot of capillary breaks, so that's gonna stop the action of water getting wicked up into the concrete. And they're also gonna add a little extra thermal mass to the foundation, which may or may not help, but it's certainly not gonna hurt. And all the dirt around me in this area has some amount of clay in it, a decent amount of clay. And when you're doing concrete on a clay soil, and just to be clear, this is like, it's, it's, it's mostly rocks and gravel, plus some silt and sand, but definitely some clay. And sometimes I can tell just by looking at it, like, oh, this, this bit has quite a lot of clay in it. You wanna be cautious with the clay because it can create two really big problems. Uh, the first one is it can draw moisture out of the slab when the concrete gets poured so your slab won't cure correctly. That's a really big problem. And the other problem is it can compact under the weight of the concrete, which will cause your slab to sink and possibly slide around. So what you have to do is you either need to do what I've done here with a couple inches of crushed rock across the entire top of it, or you can put down a class A vapor barrier, but it's gotta be a rugged one. Six mil poly won't cut it. I know a lot of people use six mil poly under slabs, but time has revealed that they actually don't hold up. Uh, they tend to get damaged during the installation of the concrete because people are walking around on it and concrete's got gravel in it. And they also deteriorate underneath the slab because of oxidation. Uh, you often hear that plastic's not biodegradable, so we don't think of it as something that will degrade, but it will degrade from oxidation and also UV degradation if it's exposed to sunlight. So if you do use a vapor barrier, make sure it's a pretty heavy duty one. Okay, so we're about to start pouring. It's actually a week later, we had to reschedule I guess uh, there was a shortage of workers last week. All the guys were sick, so I had to push it back. But uh, getting ready to pour now. So here is the finished slab and all of its glory. And yeah, now you know how to make an 80,000 pound rock. Pretty simple. In all seriousness, I'll talk about the concrete for a moment. So this is 3,000 PSI concrete and we added fiber mesh to the mix. If I get really close, let's see. You might be able to see some of the fibers. Oh, look out, little man. I'm trying to show people stuff. Look out. Oh no, look out. Anyway, I don't know if you can see them. They're pretty tiny. Uh, Micro-synthetic fibers. And I think we added about one to one and a half pounds for every yard of concrete. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what percentage that is, but it's pretty small. A uh, yard of concrete's about 4,000 pounds, so you can do the math on that. 
But yeah, the fiber mesh uh, does a couple of important things. Obviously, it reinforces the slab, but I think what's more important to know is how it reinforces the slab. So it's basically like a binding agent. It helps keep the uh, consistency of the mixture even. So when you pour the concrete and it's settling, of course, concrete is a mixture of cement, crushed rocks or gravel, sand and water. What it naturally tends to do is as it's sitting there, the gravel sinks to the bottom, water floats to the top, sand and cement sit somewhere in the middle, and that's not what you want to happen. Uh, think of it like a cake batter. You know, when you're baking a cake, you don't want to just throw all your ingredients in a mixing bowl, give it a quick stir, and then stick it in the oven. It's not going to come out right. You want to mix it thoroughly and evenly, and you want it to stay like that while it bakes. And I think maybe that's a good way of thinking about what the fiber mesh does. It suspends the aggregate materials so things don't move around and separate as much. So when it cures, it cures more evenly, and that produces a better slab. It also adds tensile flexibility to the concrete, which is important because concrete naturally has very high compressive strength, and when you add steel, that only enhances that. So you can put something really heavy down on concrete, and odds are it's probably not going to break under the weight. But its tensile strength is only a fraction of the compressive strength. So when forces act on it in a, a pulling or a pushing type of fa fashion, it has a tendency to crack. And typically, those forces won't be directly applied to the concrete, but the concrete itself is going to expand and contract naturally, um, especially while it's curing. While it's curing, it's gonna, it's gonna shrink a bit and it's gonna contract, or excuse me, contract, and that's gonna put tensile forces on the concrete, which could cause it to crack. It's also gonna continue to expand and contract for its entire lifetime, just like a, a piece of wood. As uh, temperatures change, moisture levels change, it's going to expand and contract. So again, the fiber mesh is going to help out with that over the lifetime of the concrete. Another important thing to mention is that I also added 1% calcium chloride to the mix. That's an accelerant. It accelerates the curing process by speeding up hydration. In other words, the concrete absorbs the water much more quickly. And that's a good thing because you don't want the water to dry out, you want it to get absorbed. And the calcium can speed that up by up to about 60%. I did that because the day that we poured this, it was about oh 50, or excuse me, it was about 35 degrees Fahrenheit when the concrete was poured. I don't think it got any hotter than about 50 degrees during the day, and it was overcast. So if I didn't put an accelerant in it, uh, it wouldn't have set up. It would have just remained what they call plastic which is basically you know, soft and wet, and probably would have froze overnight, and that would have ruined it. If the temperature's in the 50s or the 60s, you don't need calcium, that's optimal temperature for curing concrete. If it's above 70, you definitely don't wanna add any calcium at all. It'll get too hard too fast, that's what she said, and uh, you won't be able to work with the concrete. So as soon as you start pouring it, it's gonna to start to harden up immediately. You won't be able to properly screed it and brush it. So I just thought of something I should probably talk about now before I get a lot of questions in the comments. Some of you might have noticed that there aren't any pipes or drains or bolts anywhere in the concrete. There are a couple of reasons for that. The main reason is I just want as much flexibility as possible. As soon as I start setting things in concrete, literally, uh, that doesn't leave me very much wiggle room going forward. So if for any reason I needed to make a change to something at the last minute, could potentially be a big problem. As for the plumbing specifically, it's always been my plan to have exposed copper pipes. It's never made sen sense to me that we always hide our pipes in our walls and our floors where they become virtually inaccessible. But I'll talk a lot more about that when we actually get to the plumbing stage. Also a word of warning for anybody who might be doing a similar type of construction. So I've heard that the number one complaint or at least one of the biggest complaints from homeowners in the Southwest is that there's always at least one room, maybe two, that just can't get hot water. 
And the reason for that is because almost everyone in this region built slab on grade and they put the pipes in the slab. So if the water has to travel more than 20 feet through the concrete, it loses all its heat to the slab before it gets to where it's going. So if you are doing a slab on grade construction, you plan on putting your pipes in the concrete, you might want to make, make sure that all of your wet rooms are right next to each other and also close to your water heater. And yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. Oh, another important thing. So I calculated 14 cubic yards would be uh, just enough to fill the form. So I went ahead and ordered 16. You always want to order more concrete than you actually need because it's better to have too much than to run out after you get started. And you also want to make sure you have somewhere to put that leftover concrete because they won't keep it on the truck. And that's the last thing I'll show you right now. So this is what I did with my leftover concrete. Uh, altogether, I think I ended up with a little less than half a yard left over and I uh, poured most of it on the side of this land bridge here that I made a long time ago. Uh, this is a bridge to get to the house. There's a small gulch over here that's going across. And yeah, I just put most of it on the side there and then spread some across the top. And hopefully that's gonna help prevent it from washing out during the next monsoon season. I'm also gonna put a bunch of riprap over here where the water comes down from the mountain and that should do the trick. So yeah, that's it. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to be, well, in the next part of the series, I'm going to be framing walls, but I'll probably drop some other videos in between now and then. So yeah, I'll see you guys then. Bye.